Welcome grade 12 to the next calculus unit. We're leaving graphing behind and moving on to a different topic. And in this topic, we're gonna to investigate what kind of information calculus and the derivative calculus gives us about motion of an object in a straight line. So we're looking at an object that's moving. Think of a toy train on train tracks where the train can move along the tracks, but then it has to stop and then it has to go back. So it can only go to the right or the left. That's what we call a motion in a straight line. Of course, motion in a straight line could be vertical. For example, if you were to throw a ball up in the air or drop a ball straight down. So we're looking at that kind of motion. So we have different functions. And the first function that we're going to look at for an object moving in a straight line, it's called a position function. And traditionally, it's designated as S of T. S is going to be a function of time. So let's begin by saying that when we look at one of these functions, we'll always let T be seconds. And I think S, let's say for argument's sake, will be measured in meters. And the first specific function that I'm gonna look at is on the back of this handout, which you have. There are two examples here, which over the course of this video I'm working through, not necessarily in the same order as you see them here, but I'm gonna begin with this second function and I'll write it here. And this function, its job is to tell us the location, the position of the object at any point in time. So for the purposes of everything that I'm gonna be doing on the video, I like to use the analogy of a, or an example of a little toy train that's just going up and stopping. It's going to the right and stopping. It goes back to the left for a couple seconds, it stops. It goes back to the right, it stops. It goes back to the left, and it's just going back and forth. And imagine the situation where your little brother or sister was playing with it, left it on, walked out of the room, and you walked in. And you decided that you were gonna observe this motion and learn some things about how it's behaving. This function will tell you the physical location of that train at any point in time. Now we'll mark this like the origin. If it was a train, a little toy train, this could be, for example, the train, the, the home base or at the railroad station where people get in and off. It, it doesn't really matter what it is, but for argument's sake, we'll call it the origin. You can think of this like the x-axis then. If this is the origin, this is the positive side, and this is the negative side. When you come upon this toy train, which is moving, you have a stopwatch in your hand. You can say, gee, I'm gonna track this train's motion and I'm gonna find out where it is at different points in time. So if you click that stopwatch to begin the timing process, that's when the initial time would be. And remember, this train's already in motion. So when you let T be zero, you can see that if you could freeze for a moment, that train would literally be located right here, nine meters to the left of the origin. But of course, the train is in motion, so you have to imagine that you're freezing for a sec in your mind, and you see it flying by that marker. Let's say if T were to equal one and you plugged it into the function, you would then find out the location of that function, of that train, sorry, and look at that, S equals zero. What that means is it's right here at the origin. So that's this function. Its job is just to tell you the physical location of the object. And what we're most interested in in this, one of the things we look at is whether the object is physically located on the right side of the origin, that's where S is positive, or on the left side. And of course, that's where S is negative. Now, if you have vertical motion, let's say you had someone standing on a platform, you could conceive of the platform as the origin. If the ball goes up and it's three meters above the platform, that's where S is considered positive. This is equivalent to the origin. And if you drop the ball and it goes below the platform, that's where your position would be negative. So it depends on the situation. Now, if we look at the derivative, the derivative always measures the rate of change of the original function. So that means that this is really a velocity. 
the information that this second function gives me, the derivative of the original, is actually the speed at which the particle is moving. For example, let's do it at time zero. When we walked in the room, you'll notice that if t is zero, v works out to be 15, meaning 15 meters per second. This function gives us information about the speed at which this particle is moving at that point in time. Moreover, the fact that it's positive actually means that the object is moving to the right. If you were to put a number in that yielded a negative value, for example, if velocity works out to be, I'll arbitrarily make up a number, negative 12 meters per second, that means the speed that it is moving at is 12 meters per second. The negative indicates that its direction is to the left. If we're looking at horizontal motion like this, in this situation, negative velocity tells you that the particle is going down. Positive velocity would mean going up. Positive velocity here means the particle is moving to the right. Negative velocity tells you the particle is moving to the left. So we can use these two, fun these two functions, and I'm going to begin with those two. I'm going to rewrite them here. But it's always important to write these functions in factored form because we're going to be using them to do calculations. And the calculations are easier when the functions are in factored form. So remember to factor a cubic. We try s of 1, s of negative 1 until we find the value that makes this zero. And of course, remember when I let s be 1 up, t be 1 up here, I got lucky. So that means that t minus 1 is one of the factors. And if I do synthetic division, 1, negative 7, 15, negative 9, I'll quickly find the other factor, 1, negative 6, 9, 0. We get x squared minus 6x plus 9. Oops, t squared, sorry. And that gives us t minus 1, t minus 3 squared. So there is my position function in factored form. If you look back up at the derivative, I'm now going to rewrite the, the derivative function, which is my velocity function, in factored form. And so 3t, t, 5, and 3 to make 15. I need to get 14, so I'm going to have negative and negative. There we go. They factor. If it doesn't factor, obviously, you would leave it. Most of the examples we give you will factor. And we can begin to look at some of the questions asked in the example. And depending on what the question is asking, you have to know which of the two functions to use to provide the answer. So if you look at 2a on your handout, number 2a says, where is the particle's initial location? Well, location implies you use your position function. Initial implies you let t be zero. So basically, they're saying, where is this particle located at time t equals zero? And again, because we have the function here, it's very clear and easy to work it out. We get negative 9. So it's 9 meters left of the origin. And that's where its original location is, as mentioned before. But the second question says, what is its initial speed? So the initial speed, of course, means we're going to be using your velocity function. Initial, again, means t equals 0. And we've already done this. v of 0 in the velocity function. Again, this is the easiest way to calculate it. You can see it's 15. You can use the factored version because you would get negative 5 times negative 3, but you get 15. So it's going at a speed of 15 meters per second, and I know that it's moving to the right. And that's 2a. Now, 2b brings up a whole different idea. And this is an analysis of this object's motion. And it's saying, when is it moving away from the origin? And when is this object headed towards? If you think of it as a train, 
and you're saying, when is the train heading back to the station? Or when is the train traveling away from the station? So we break it, this idea into towards, and we'll call the station the origin, or away. Notice if this is the origin or the station, if the train is located over here on the right side where the position is positive, in order for this tra train to be headed towards the origin, it would be having to move to the left. So you're on the right, but you would have to be moving left. And if you have that situation, it's moving towards the origin. Notice that if the train had been located over here on the left, if it were moving left, it wouldn't be going towards the station. In other words, when the position is negative, if you want the train to be going back home, then it has to move to the right. And if you notice, they have opposite signs. That is, this is positive, but velocity is negative. The similar idea holds true. If the train is located over here, where its position is positive, sorry, we can't see that, then in order to be going away, you need to have a situation where the, the train is going that way. Because if you're on the right, you better keep going to the right to stay away, 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 away. If you're on the left, you're over here, you need for this train to be going away to be going to the left. Again, notice that the, pos the position is negative, the velocity is negative, that's left. On the right, the position is positive, going to the right, velocity is positive. So basically, when they have the same sign, it's away, and when they have different signs, negative, positive, it's going towards. So how does that help us resolve the exact times when this particular train is in motion? That's what I'm gonna do right now. So I'm gonna move to a new page and recopy the given information so this is towards or away. And this is how we do an analysis to determine it. I rewrite my functions and I'm gonna put them in factored form because this is really where that is much more helpful. And then I have my velocity function. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a factor table like we've been using we just finished using it a lot in the graphing unit in order to determine intervals of increase or intervals of concavity. We're going to use a similar idea here to help us answer the question when this train is moving towards the origin or away. So what you do is you're going to make your number line. Now remember, T can't be negative because it's measuring seconds. And in particular, this question specifies that t is only going from zero to seven. So when we make our number line, we're really only interested in the t values between zero and seven. And what you're going to put, what numbers you're going to put on this particular um, graph is wherever s equals zero, which mathematically would be when t equals one, or three, let me use pencil to make sure. And you also put the times when V equals zero, which would be five thirds and also three, which is already there. So these numbers are the zeros of the two different functions. Now the first function I'm going to look at is gonna be the position function. I'll do the work over here. Again, if you wanna make a much larger factor table to do the work on the side by all means, but I'm gonna put a test value into this to determine simply if S is positive or if S is negative, just like we did with, with derivatives in the previous unit. So if you take a test value, let's say a half, a half minus one is negative. Because we square this, this second factor is eternally positive, S is negative in this interval. 
from one to one and two thirds, if you take a test value like 1.1, for example, this would be 1.6. So 1.1 is in the interval. This is now positive. This guy's always positive. And so S is positive. You take a number in this interval, say a two, same thing is gonna happen. And then you take even a four and it's positive across the board. What this means, if you interpret it, is that for one second, the train is totally going back and forth in this neighborhood on the left, but all the rest of the time, the other six seconds, it's going back and forth on this side because you can see it's physically somewhere in negative territory for the first second, but after that, it's always in positive territory. Now we're gonna do the velocity. So again, we're gonna change our function now to the velocity, and we're gonna determine positive or negative at each of these intervals. If you let it be a half, this is one and a half minus five, this is a half minus three. In this interval, velocity is positive. If you take 1.1, that would be 3.3 .3 minus 5, still negative. That's still negative. Velocity is still positive. Once you get to something like 2 as a sample value, this factor, this first term becomes positive, this factor. 2 minus 3 is negative. The product is negative. And so we're determining the sign of velocity in each interval. Test value like 5, they're both positive, and we get this. But here is where we get the information about towards or away. Because again, I'm going to articulate it, but the, if S is negative in this interval from zero to one seconds, he's somewhere over here. The positive V means that he's located here, but he's moving to the right. And so you can see he's moving towards. So sometimes you can just literally make a little sketch and think about it. A lot of people memorize, if the signs are different, it's towards. If the signs are the same, it's moving away. Because if you're located on the positive side and you're moving positive, you're moving away. In this case, this information says that I am located on the positive side, new diagram, but I am moving to the left, meaning I'm moving towards. And then in this interval, I'm on the right, moving right, and so I'm moving away. And you can actually see for the first second which way the train is moving, where he's located, and it gives you a fair bit of information about the motion of this train. Now, writing the intervals out, you have to be super careful because there's some subtleties here. If you want to tell me the exact times that this train is moving towards the origin, you have to be careful never to include these numbers because these are the zeros of these functions. And when you have a zero for this, it means, for example, when t is one, you are physically, t equals one makes a zero, you're physically located, s equals zero, right at the origin, right at the train station. So you can't be heading towards it because you're there, you're at it. You can't be going away because you are at the station. And so you do not want to include this value for that reason. This is here because it makes velocity zero. You don't include that because if velocity is zero, it means the train is stopped. If the train is stopped, you're not moving towards, you're not moving away, you're not moving. So these zeros are always excluded when I write the intervals. So going towards, I would put t is zero to one. We do not include these for the reasons that I just described. I do want to include t equals zero. Because you remember when t equals zero, this train was in motion. He had a velocity of 15 meters a second, and he was located negative nine. So he was moving, and he was moving towards it. So you include the zero. The other time, that interval would be from five thirds to three. We exclude all those zeros. And then we do the same thing for when he's going away. We take the interval from one to five thirds. We exclude them because they are the zeros. And then we look at three to seven. Again, that's a zero, but this is here because we're just counting up to that point in time. And at that point in time, this vehicle will have motion 
and he won't be at the origin. Therefore, you need to include the seven because at t equals seven, he is actually moving away from the origin. And that's how you would answer to C. Okay, I'm now gonna move on to another concept, another way to, analyze, to analyze uh, the train's motion. We have to introduce another function because we started off with S of T equaling T cubed minus seven T squared. And we took the derivative, which we call the velocity function, because it measures how quickly the position is changing. If we take the derivative of the velocity, which remember is the second derivative of position, the first derivative was velocity, right? The second derivative of s, which is the first, the vol you get what I mean? <laughs> Felt me stumbling on my words. That's 6t minus 14. That is called acceleration. Now, for all you physics people, you'll excuse me if I'm messing this up, but in order to understand acceleration in the easiest way, I literally think of acceleration as a push. If a person is walking to the right and I come up behind them and push them in the same direction that they are walking, on their back, I give a good push, they're gonna stumble and go faster. It's gonna cause them to speed up. But if a person is walking or running to the right and I stand here and when they come to me, I push back on them on their chest, I'm gonna be slowing them down. So it's the idea that acceleration is a push and it has a direction. When acceleration is positive, we push to the right. When acceleration is negative, we push to the left. In the real world, you could think of a car. The car starts off at two kilometers an hour, then 10 kilometers an hour, then 30 kilometers an hour, and the speed is changing. Acceleration is measuring the rate at which the speed, the velocity, changes. Uh, the Push against is the equivalent of putting on the brakes. So if the car is trying to go forward and you put on the brakes, that's like pushing against. So the idea would be that when the push and the direction is the same as the velocity, when they are both the same, you speed up. And this is acceleration. If the push is in the opposite direction, it causes you to slow down. So we're gonna find out the exact moments when this particular train is literally speeding up or when it's slowing down. And we're gonna do it the same way that we did um, this kind of chart that gave us information about when it's moving towards or away. We're gonna do a similar idea, but this time because we need to use acceleration and we need to use velocity to determine when they're positive and negative. So I'm going to write them again because we need them in factored form. So we have um, 3t minus five and t minus three as my velocity function, and then the acceleration function in factored form will be take out the common factor of two, three T minus seven. And so you always wanna have your functions in factored form, and then we're gonna create a factor table, same idea, from zero to seven. We put the zeros of the two functions we're interested in, which in this case is five thirds, three and seven thirds. So we would go five thirds, seven thirds and three, giving us all of these different sections. We're gonna look at the sign, whether velocity is positive or negative in each of these sections. And we're gonna do the same thing for acceleration. So I'm going to take a test value. I'll write the uh, velocity again over here so we can see the testing. And I'm going to put in like the number one, and this is going to be negative. And this, oops, this is, yep, a negative times a negative is positive. So velocity is positive 
in this section. Then we put a number like, this is one point, so I can put two here, that's two point something. Six minus five, two minus three, a positive times a negative, and we get a negative. In between two and a third and three would be something like 2.5. So that's what I'll use as a test value. Three times 2.5 is 7.5 minus five, that's positive. 2.5 minus three is negative, so the product is still negative. And then three and seven, you could take a test value like five, and these are both positive. And so we have the vehicle for the first one and two third seconds is moving to the right. From five thirds till three, for all that time, the vehicle's moving left. The last three to seven seconds, it's moving right. That's what this tells you. Let's look at acceleration. If you have um, two times three T minus seven, anything less than seven thirds, this is negative, like a one or a two. Anything greater than it, would be positive. Again, you can do that more slowly with test values. But it is the combination of these two functions that's going to tell me that if the velocity is going to the right, but the acceleration is going to the left, I'm gonna be slowing down in those first one and two thirds seconds. In this interval, both motions take us to the left. Therefore, because it's the same direction, pushing is going to make you go faster. The object is moving left, but I'm pushing against it, so it's going to slow down. And again, they're both in the same direction, so I can see that I'm speeding up. Now again, by the same reasoning as the previous example, these three numbers are here because either velocity is zero, which means you're stopped, or acceleration is zero, which means no push. If you don't get a push, you can't speed up or slow down where there's no push. And where there's no motion, you can't be speeding up or slowing down. So you exclude these. So we say that the object is slowing from zero to five thirds. I will include zero because there is both push and velocity there. And then it's slowing from seven thirds to three. I exclude them both because they're zeros. Speeding up, let's see if I can squish it in here, would be from five thirds to seven thirds. I exclude both because they're zeros. And speeding up from three to seven. Exclude this because at t equals three, it stops. But at t equals seven, there is both velocity and acceleration, so we include it. And so these are the interval where the train speeds up or slows down. Now what I'm gonna do is switch now and go to example one, because example one on your handout is also asking a question, determine whether a particle traveling on a straight line is speeding up or slowing down, but it's very specific. It's saying at the time when t equals four. So in order to answer a question like that, what I'm going to do over here, is I'm going to write the function s, which is 9t minus 8t squared in factored form also, just because I like to have all three functions. I find them all and I factor them all. And that's usually how I begin every question. I take s, I factor it. I find the derivative, which is 9 minus 16t. And if possible, I factor it. This doesn't factor. And then I take the derivative of that, which in this case is negative 16, and that's my acceleration. So you wanna have all three functions before you start any question. You want them in factored form as well. And that's an important thing to do every time you start a new question. Now when you go to answer this question, you'll have the functions ready to go. And it asks when t equals four, are we speeding up or are we slowing? So what we need to find is v when it's four. We have the function here, nine minus 16 times four is nine minus 64, which is a negative. The number's less important. The point is it's negative. 
we then find a of 4, and of course it's always negative 16. What this basically says is that for this particular situation, there is always a push to the left. Always, no matter what time you pick. So certainly at 4 seconds, the push is negative. And remember, when the push and the motion are in the same direction, V is negative, A is negative. Same direction, that tells me the object is speeding up at t equals 4. So that's how you answer number 1. Okay. Now the last thing I'm going to do, and again, these questions are all more complicated than you might think, in the sense that you can't just look at a function most of the time and know the answer to the question. Obviously, if I say, where is it located at a certain time, you can. How fast is it going, you can. But if I ask you anything about moving away or towards, speeding up or slowing down, you can see it's a complicated calculation. The other last complicated calculation, it's not an obvious one, is calculating the total distance that the object moves. And in this case, the question is saying in the first five seconds. So even if t can go as high as seven, we're just analyzing the total distance this object moved in the first five seconds. So the way you do this is you make a little table of values with time and this is your position. Now, the, the values that you're gonna put down the side for this particular um, thing to get total distance, well, you start when t is zero because you wanna know where the train was located, the object was located at the moment that you started timing and watching the motion. So at t equals zero, and you use the s function, which I'm going to put here in factor form, and you sub in t equals zero, but we've already done this many times, and when t equals zero, s worked out to be negative nine. This, we're tracking this uh, particles motion, this train's motion, only until t equals 5. So obviously you want to put a 5 here, and then you want to find the value when s is 5, and that's why factored form is so much easier. So you get 4 times 2 squared, you get 16. This means when t equals 5, the train is located 16 meters to the right of the origin. The other values you fill in here are when v equals zero, when this train stops. And remember, my velocity function is 3t minus 5 times t minus 3. And so the values that I want to have here are the zeros, which is 5 thirds and 3. And so the stop and the start, the start and the stop, and the two zeros from velocity. I want to know where the train is when it stops. And so you have to sub 5 thirds into the, the S function to find the location. So when you work this out, this is 2 thirds. This is 5 thirds minus 9 thirds is negative. 4 thirds squared, 16 times 2, you get 32 over 27, which is about 1.2 meters. So that's 1.2. And the last thing is where is it when v is z, uh, three when t is three, where is that train located? And so we sub three in and we get zero. He's at the origin. So these particular uh, values are important for the following because when I use this, and I'm also going to go back and use my velocity chart here because it helps me make a diagram of the motion of this train in the following way. You make a nice long number line, and this is the origin, the train station. You then mark this location right here at negative nine, and I like to say that's where t is zero. Now you use this chart to help you velocity, and you can use it from either of your two calculations because it's the same but I like to use the one up here. Velocity is to the right, to the right, all the way to 5 thirds. 
And so what you do is you make an arrow that says, I'm going to the right, I'm going to the right, I'm going to the right, until T is five thirds. And here I'm located 1.2 meters to the right of the origin. So these two plus signs indicate draw an arrow to the right. You're always going from here to this time. Notice from five thirds to three, as you can see on the chart, both charts, you're going left. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, oh, I better go backwards. And it says, go backwards until the origin. So this is when T equals three and you're at zero. So we go right and left, right and left. And the last thing from three only to five seconds is you go to the right. So here's T equals three and I go all the way to the right to the right and I stop at T equals three and I'm at 16 meters to the right of the origin. So now we track total distance. To go from negative nine to 1.2 would be nine plus the 1.2, which is 10.2 meters. When we were at 1.2, we came back to the origin, we traveled 1.2 meters. Then we started at the origin, we went all the way out to 16, so we traveled another 16. And so we see that the total is 10, 11, what is this? 27.4 meters total distance traveled. And that is basically the idea with all the calculations of what you have to do in this unit. I've covered these examples. Now you can go to do the homework, which you can see is the next, the, the third page of this handout. And then there's questions from the book. Good luck.